This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome to Camp Myth. Chapter 3, October 9th, 2013. Welcome back, campers. Last week, Felix checked in for his journey to summer camp. We saw more of the creatures Felix shares his world with, and we learned about all the types of supernatural contraband the camp keeps an eye out for. I wonder what Gollum scrolls do. Now listen close, campers. Where were we? Ah, yes. Camp Myth. Phoenix Watching. By Chris Lewis Carter. Chapter 3. Oh, that reminds me. There's something else I should explain now that we're on our way to becoming friends. I'm a, a fae. Not a sprite or an elf, and especially not a pixie. I don't sprinkle magic dust, or wear a funny hat, or anything like that. In fact, I'm going to bet that I look more human than you'd expect. Well, except for the long pointy ears and markings on my forehead that could be mistaken for green acne from a distance. If there's one thing that bothers me, though, it's how you humans always picture the Fae as a bunch of frail, innocent creatures with butterfly wings and lilacs in our hair. Don't be fooled by what you've been told. We're actually pretty tough. In fact, the average Fae is more likely to create lightning and fire instead of rainbows and sparkles. Mythic Myth conception number one. Fae are not wimps. See, you're learning already. Once I made it through the registration kiosks, I brought my suitcase over to a group of squat-looking gnomes in Camp Myth t-shirts who were loading everyone's luggage onto motorised carts. Beyond that, the rest of the quarry was littered with buses of all shapes and sizes, each numbered and positioned about a hundred feet apart. Shiny yellow school buses, dingy grey prison buses with bars across the windows, and even a massive double-decker bus with the words London Transport stenciled across the side. It almost looked like an incredibly well-organised parking lot, except for the obvious fact that none of the buses could have driven to the quarry, since none of them had wheels. No rims, no tyres, nothing. What they all did have, however, were pairs of enormous metal rods that had been attached to both sides of the frames like oversized bird perches. Some of the lower-numbered buses were already filled with campers, though. Like number three, a lime-coloured scrap heap that was packed with excited dryads. As I passed by, I could see their green-tinted faces and vine-like fingers pressing against the window glass. Number seven, one of the school buses, was crammed full of red caps, small wiry goblins with blood-red hats that cackled and bounced in their seats. A pack of them had even climbed onto the bus roof and were slapping and punching each other in chaotic delight. Number ten, now that was crazy. Cyclopes, dozens of them, each nearly seven feet tall and practically bursting out of their clothing. Although the bus doors were open, almost all of them were standing outside, forming a loose circle around two of their own, who were locked at the arms, grunting and growling, each trying to push the other to the ground. After a brief struggle, the larger Cyclops, a fearsome beast with thick black braids tattooed across his arms and legs, gave a mighty shove that sent his opponent tumbling to the dirt. He let out a roar of triumph as the rest of the group began chanting, Ropes! 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 I had just reached the low twenties when I spotted the first glimpse of movement in the cloudless summer sky. It was only a tiny dot at first, but grew larger by the second and flew faster than any human-made plane I'd ever seen. As it came closer, I noticed that its wings were wobbling like crazy. Actually, that wasn't quite right. They weren't wobbling. They were flapping! By now the thing was close enough for me to tell that it wasn't a plane at all. It was a gigantic bird soaring through the air like a great red comet. Suddenly it began to descend, diving like a falcon that had just spotted its prey. And it was headed right for me. I'd been told that rocks, or rooks as some people call them, 
were intimidating to see up close, but I never could have imagined how amazing they were to watch in action. When it was no more than 50 feet above the ground, it spread its massive wings and made a single flap to pull itself out of the dive. The gust was so powerful that it sent me sailing backwards like a tumbleweed in the breeze. As I picked myself up and brushed the dirt from my clothes, the rock coasted until it reached the first bus in line, then wrapped its talons around the rod sticking out from each side and effortlessly lifted the vehicle off the ground. I watched in awe as bird and bus climbed higher and higher until they were both swallowed up by the clouds. Two new dots appeared on the horizon, followed by another three. More and more rocks were arriving at the quarry now, sweeping down and hauling off the remaining buses. I decided to run the rest of the way to my ride. I wasn't about to risk being late after that. 26 was close to being filled, but I was lucky enough to find an empty seat near the middle. The other first year fake campers were all chattering on about the usual boring stuff, like newly developed magic runes, and who would be the next winner of the Grove's annual conjuration challenge. So I contented myself with looking out the window, watching the rocks casually perform their duties. In fact, one had just lifted bus 23 when I felt someone poke me on the shoulder. Can I, can I sit here, please? Every fay on the bus fell silent and glared at him suspiciously. Go back to your own kind, one eye, someone shouted from the back. Yeah, we only take people with depth perception, called another, causing a ripple of smug laughter. The cyclops slumped his shoulders and turned to leave, but I tapped him on the arm. If it makes you feel any better, I'm not a fan of most fay either, I said. Come on, sit down. He nodded, then collapsed onto the seat, breathing like he was about to pass out. Um, are you okay? I asked. Just a second. He wheezed, then reached into his pocket and pulled out a device I'd never seen before. He shook it a few times, placed it to his mouth and pressed down on the top. It made a hissing noise and he took a deep gulp of air. What is that anyway? Some kind of cyclopean healing magic? He raised his one eyebrow at me. Uh, no. This is an inhaler. I have asthma. I wasn't sure exactly what this uh, asthma meant, but I made a mental note to find out more about it later. What was much more interesting to me at that moment was how decidedly uncyclops-like this cyclops seemed from all the others. He was probably just under six feet tall, which was short by Cyclops standards, and had a large stomach that rested on his lap as he sat. A tiny horn poked up from a tuft of brown hair on top of his head, and he wore a giant glasses lens over his emerald green eye. His t-shirt was entirely too small, clinging to him like stretched out plastic wrap, and his khaki shorts were skin tight and cut off well above his knees. It's nice to meet you, he said, extending a sweaty palm. My name is, well, it's... Argus Virgil Theocritus, but just call me Argy. It's easier. Thanks for letting me sit here. Felix, I said, accepting the handshake. No problem. First time going to camp, too? Yeah, that wasn't exactly my idea. But my dad's a counsellor, so I didn't have much of a choice. He removed his lens and rubbed his temples. Oh, he is going to kill me when he finds out I got off the Cyclops bus. Number ten, I said, recalling the insanity of the challenge circle. Not what you'd call a group of my closest friends. Argy replied, then sighed. Dad pulled some strings so I could ride with my brother, but he wasn't doing either of us a favour. Ropes managed to pick three fights in the first twenty minutes of us getting there. I'm nervous enough about flying as it is. I didn't want to risk getting caught up in one of his stupid brawls while we're a billion feet in the air. <sighs> So I ran. Ropes? I thought back to the muscle-bound monster with the braided tattoos and couldn't believe that they were related in any way, let alone brothers. Suddenly a female voice near the front of the bus cut through the surrounding chatter. Hello, campers! How y'all doing today? 
Climbing up the stairs was a girl who looked a few years older than me, maybe 19 or 20, who wore a Camp Myth t-shirt over a colourful summer dress that appeared to be made from thousands of real flower petals. Her hair was bright blonde, so much that it shimmered in the sunlight filtering through the windows, and her skin was tinged with a slight green hue. She was easily one of the prettiest girls I had ever seen. When no one responded to her question, she placed her hands on her hips in mock disgust. Aw, oh, come on, gang. You could do better than that. I said, How y'all doing today? Her voice was sweet, yet perky, like a beauty pageant contestant. A few of the kids eventually murmured something in response, and that seemed to be good enough for her. That's great. Okay, so my name is Lil. And for those of you who aren't familiar with my kind, I'm a dryad. Well, a wood nymph, if you want to be all technical about it. We're just about ready to take off, so I'd like to explain what to expect during our flight. Lil cleared her throat, then continued. Our carrier for this trip will be Turbo, a seven-month-old red-crested rock that will be making his very first ever camp run today. Beside me, I could hear Argy gulp at those words. But there's absolutely nothing to worry about, she said as if reading his mind. I've been personally training him ever since he was a hatchling. Trust me, he's a total pro. Lil popped open the glove compartment and pulled out a handful of brightly coloured wrappers. We also have fair-proof snacks available if anyone would like something to eat along the way. Baked tree bark, dried moss, mushroom chews... Just say the word. She put away the food and peered out through the windshield, then squealed in delight. Ooh, it looks like he's right on time. She chirped. Okay, our total flight time will be three hours and 47 minutes. So relax, make some new friends, and have a ton of fun. This week's Camper Spotlight is Amelia, the aquatic animal admirer. Felix says, Sirens are known to form lifelong bonds with sea creatures, which explains why Amelia found it so hard to leave her pet tiger dolphins, Umbra and Penumbra, back home for the summer. I drew this picture to help make her feel better. Also, to learn more about tiger dolphins. Turns out it's a siren thing. Figures. Amelia was created by Dwayne Hart. You can find the picture of her on the Camp Myth webpage. Cast of Wonders could use your help. We love bringing you your free stories week after week, but we can't do it without you. Please consider donating at castofwonders.org, where you'll find buttons for regular and one-time donations via PayPal. Or help spread the word about our Camp Myth and our weekly stories by blogging or tweeting about us. Or write us a review on iTunes and like our Facebook page. There's a lot of ways you can show your love for our tales of the fantastic. Camp Myth Phoenix Watching is a Cast of Wonders production brought to you by Wolfsbane Publishing and featuring the voice talents of Kate Baker, Adam Black, Tina Connolly, Graham Dunlop, Christiniana Ellis, Marguerite Kenner, Alethea Contis, Alistair Stewart, Ian Stewart, and Barry J. Northern. You can learn more about the world of Camp Myth at our website, castofwonders.org. Our weekly episodes are released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it, but don't change it or sell it. The Camp Myth theme tune, August, is by Cast of Wonders' favorite musical artist, Alexi Nov, from musicalley.com. Thanks for listening.